Executive Branch Efficiency Task Force. Uh, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Nemes. Present. Senator Westerfield. Senator Yates. Representative Baker. Here. Representative McCool. Here. Representative Mentor. Senator Mills. I'm here. Representative Miller. Present. So we have a quorum. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to ask a, a motion uh, to pass the minutes of the October 24 meeting. I'll move. Second. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oppose, like sign. It is before us. <clears throat> we have made a habit of reading the charge of the task force at the uh, beginning of every meeting. So I shall do that at this point. Uh, the task force was uh, developed to take a wide but deep look into the functions of the executive branch of the Commonwealth. Specifically, the hope is that we will be able to go cabinet by cabinet, allow them to come in and explain their structure from the top down and how they function. This will lead to further conversations on how each cabinet is funded and their budget building practices. Additionally, these meetings will give the cabinets the opportunity to propose to the legislature future reorganization plans and any other proposals aimed at increasing efficiencies that require legislative action. Overall, the task force should produce information helpful to the General Assembly in increasing government efficiency in the 2023 session and beyond. Very well. And yes, uh, Senator. May I make a comment, Mr. Chairman? You may. I want everyone to know that this is a sad day that uh, Chairman Miller, this is his last uh, meeting as chairman, and we will, oh, this committee. Yes. we will definitely miss him. He's been an asset to Kentucky, not just his district, but all of Kentucky. And I always thought he was much younger than me because he looks much younger than me in better shape, but he's actually older. So uh, we, we wish him well in his retirement, well-deserved, and we want to thank you. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate that. Um, well, welcome, uh, Secretary. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, and those at the table uh, introduce themselves, and the floor will be yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Mike Barry. I'm the Secretary of Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet, uh, and it is a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you, uh, Chair Miller. Um, Representative Miller, um, Russ Meyer, Commissioner of uh, Kentucky State Parks. Um, thank you for having us here today. And uh, I'll echo what uh, Senator Nemes said. Um, thank you for your service. Uh, and I had the honor of uh, coming in with uh, Representative Miller um, in uh, January 1, 15, I believe, we came exactly. in together. And then I got to uh, sit... Uh, Right uh, next to um, same Jerry, row, right? We represent we Miller. Row mates, and, uh, <laughs> uh, hard worker, and uh, carried a lot of bills. Who's going to carry the torch now? Is what I want to know. But well, thank uh, you, <laughs> thank you for your service and all you've done for the Commonwealth. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Anita Hatchett, Executive Director of Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet. Okay, thank you. Floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, as I said before the meeting, it, uh, um, this may not be new news for you as having been a former member of our cabinet, uh, but, but things do change. Uh, I've seen that in my tenure. I've seen it last week uh, as much. So um, we uh, are happy to be here today to uh, uh, explain a little bit about how we're uh, how we operate as a cabinet and uh, uh, share with you the PowerPoint presentation that, that you should have now in front of you in printed form and that appears on the screen. Um, the mission of the the cabinet is to support uh, and promote and develop Kentucky tourism, arts and heritage as a mechanism to foster economic growth uh, and uh, education, employment for our communities throughout the Commonwealth while appealing as a destination to a diverse audi audience at home, nationally and internationally. And I think a lot of times, you know, we forget that we 
market tourism not only to people who are non-Kentuckians, but it's very important that some of our best customers, so to speak, are Kentuckians. Uh, and we found that out during the pandemic as people chose not to travel great deals, they still wanted to go somewhere and they wanted to get outside. And uh, Kentucky offers those opportunities. And so we spent a lot of time at that point marketing the, the lakes in western Kentucky to the folks that were in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and vice versa. And we think that uh, we have increased uh, the awareness and the appreciation of all Kentuckians for what we have here uh, in tourism. The overview of the cabinet, uh, we're dedicated to fostering and promoting the state's rich heritage as well as continuing our long, our long history of being a premier travel destination. And uh, we serve as the top tourism organization uh, and agency for the state. Uh, but most importantly, we work with a lot of partners, partners uh, uh, in the legislature, partners in communities and in, in DMOs, those destination marketing organizations or tourism commissions that are out in the state. And uh, we do that through marketing and outreach. Uh, and then also we, we have lots of partners that are out there in the travel industry that come to us uh, and, and want us to assist them in, in learning why we think Kentucky is uh, a very hot destination to travel to. Um, the cabinet is, is very diverse. Uh, and I guess when I came into this, I didn't realize how diverse that it was. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit today about those 13 agencies that appear on the screen everywhere from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the commissioners here from Parks, uh, all the way through the Kentucky State Fair Board, which is, has one of the largest uh, exposition centers in the country. And um, all those agencies in between, they all play a very vital role in the promotion of tourism for the Commonwealth. Um, you can see here in very small print our organization chart, uh, the office of the secretary and the, the branches that we have in it. But more importantly, there are 13 agencies that appear uh, in our cabinet, and uh, we're going to talk about them a little bit today. The, the best thing about these 13 agencies is how collaborative that we are. Um, our agencies often combine with each other. Some of them are similar, some of them are very different, but that doesn't mean that they can't collaborate to help promote Kentucky. They work directly on projects together uh, and cross promote through different campaigns and events. So some collaborative efforts that we've done before have included like the Kentucky Arts Council does uh, in March of each year, uh, a show called Kentucky Crafted. And they use the All Tech Arena at the Kentucky Horse Park uh, to house that market. Uh, and it's a, it's a very important time for Kentucky artisans and craftsmen craftsmen because it's where they go to actually promote uh, the, the uh, crafts and the art that they produce uh, and to get it sold uh, out in the market. Some other collaborative efforts include uh, the Kentucky Arts Council um, and uh, the Department of Tourism and State Parks uh, teamed up for a collaborative Fun in the Sun sweepstakes uh, that we had over the summer to market travel to the Kentucky State Park. So you can uh, travel to the State Park. Uh, we promote that, but you can also uh, view and, and exchange information with uh, Kentucky artisans. Kentucky State Parks and the Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources have continuously worked together on what's called the Kentucky Wild Program. Monarch butterfly tagging events, conservation efforts. Um, they've also uh, worked together to conduct control burns for habitat management. Uh, and you'll see many of those uh, wildlife areas in, uh, that are physically uh, near or within state parks. The Arts Council, the Kentucky Historical Society, and the Kentucky Heritage Council work together uh, to create and to uh, plan for the Kentucky COVID-19 Memorial, uh, which will be dedicated in the near future. Uh, this past year also, our cabinet teamed with WKDZ, uh, which is in Katy's, Kentucky, uh, for their Agritourism Edition podcast. Um, and, you know, we've found that agritourism is a very important part of selling Kentucky. Um, you know, you may think, well, when you come to Kentucky, what are you going to do that's agriculture? Well, obviously, the... the uh, 
bourbon industry is part of the agriculture industry, the, the, the burgeoning wine industry in Kentucky. But also, as I found out firsthand, you can go to uh, Edmar Dairy up in northern Kentucky and where those folks had literally a dairy operation. They've, they've thrown in the tourism component and visitors go up there by the droves to learn how to uh, that ice cream is made or to go out there and feed a calf or even to learn to milk a cow. Uh, and uh, so there is a market for agritourism out there. The Cabinet also is a proud sponsor of Secrets of Bluegrass Chefs, which is a television show that is seen in uh, uh, two of the major television markets in the state. Um, in doing that, uh, this coming season, the Kentucky State Parks, the Artisan Center, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife will all have segments on that. And uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife's Field to Fork program will uh, actually present uh, a, 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 a television segment uh, that will show people how you can hunt and also serve and eat uh, the, the game that you can catch in, or uh, that, that you can bag in Kentucky. And speaking of sponsorships, the, the, the cabinet and our agencies are very involved in um, art sponsorships, museum sponsorships. I was telling the commissioner just a minute ago on Saturday night, uh, I was at the uh, Crawford, or the Beringer Crawford Museum, which is up in Northern Kentucky in Covington, uh, for their unveiling of the White Christmas memorabilia and all the dresses and costumes from that iconic movie. Uh, and uh, we were a supporter of that because um, that collection, which is uh, housed, it, it travels, but it's housed primarily in Augusta, Kentucky, in the Rosemary Clooney House, uh, is one of the, the hottest and, and one of the most uh, popular travel destinations uh, in northeastern Kentucky. Um, so from a, a dollars and, and cents standpoint, the uh, Tourism Arts and Heritage Cabinet uh, from the cabinet standpoint, in this current fiscal year, we receive over $3.8 million in general funds. About $17.5 million uh, is uh, budgeted for the transient room tax. Uh, you all are aware of that, that 1% uh, tax when you stay at hotels, et cetera, that helps us to market the state. Uh, and then uh, in this year, uh, we have, through federal funds, uh, had a total of 92 million, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 92 million fi 500,000 uh, ARP, uh, or American Rescue Plan Act funds, uh, which we'll get into that in just a little uh, bit because uh, some of those are currently um, uh, ready to be distributed. In those general funds, I uh, just wanted to point out uh, they're distributed by agencies, the Kentucky Center for African American Heritage, 150000 through the uh, through the General Assembly's budget, Friends of the Holt House, $300,000 that was also uh, uh, designated in the budget. There are restricted funds in our cabinet. Uh, that is uh, uh, that 1% that, uh, money, we distribute money uh, or funds to the Regional Marketing and Matching Program, uh, which is uh, set up by statute. Uh, and there's a report to the governor and LRC that occurs each year by September 1st. Um, we were talking about the tourism recovery and investment uh, from uh, the, the ARPA money. Um, tourism and destination marketing organizations through the General Assembly's uh, generosity uh, and supported by the governor, uh, that, that was a $75 million um, price tag. Uh, in addition, um, a half million dollars to the Kentucky Science Center and ARPA money, the Kentucky 4-H Foundation, $5 million, and the Louisville Arena Authority, $12 million. <clears throat> So a little bit more on the, the, the ARPA dollars and uh, some familiar faces uh, I, I think are in the room when uh, I was with uh, Commissioner Manjit when we did a presentation on that. Um, the ARPA money, which is federal dollars that were allotted by the General Assembly, totals 75 million, and it was divided into four pools. Pool number one, or they call them, federal government calls them tranches, and that just sounds like a weird name to me, so we changed it to pools. Um, pool number one is $15 million for marketing and promoting tourism in Kentucky. Uh, we will be continuing to do a lot of the outreach in markets that tourism has not necessarily uh, had the funds or the ability to market in. 
Uh, pool number two uh, is $25 million distributed to tourism commissions for marketing individual communities through Kentucky. Uh, that pool uh, was opened. We had 94 uh, individual uh, entities, DMOs, and some fiscal courts who handle their um, uh, tourism marketing for their communities uh, that applied for that $25 million. And uh, I would say sometime this week we will probably see the, uh, uh, the, the designations go out in that, as well as in pool number three, the $25 million that would be distributed directly to tourism commissions for attracting meetings and conventions. And then pool four, um, that's what's called the partnership for multi-jurisdiction collaborative marketing. That uh, tranche or that pool of money, the application process just closed uh, and is under review right now. But those are from multi-jurisdictions. In other words, if we can figure out how uh, Bowling Green and uh, Corbin can do a multi-jurisdictional marketing program. Um, and I will tell you there uh, are some very creative folks from what I have seen so far. Uh, how they uh, are, are after these dollars. But again, these are vital dollars, not only to help Kentucky recover from uh, the pandemic and the hit that was taken in, in the tourism travel industry, but I'll tell you these dollars will help us be able to get ahead of the curve uh, and be able to, to come out of this even stronger than we were before the pandemic. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, before we go over into the Heritage Council, just to let you know, uh, there were some additional uh, uh, federal dollars, CARES Act money, uh, that did come to the Department of Tourism uh, earlier in the year, um, or I'm sorry, in last fiscal year. And um, we use that to promote Kentucky as a diverse travel uh, organization. And we recently got our return of investment report on that and found that for every dollar spent, $66 was generated in economic impact. And that's an incredible number. It's bigger than we normally see in our usual investments. So being able to go after um, the buses, uh, the, Amer the American Bus Association, the, the motor coach market, to be able to market in Canada to African American and Latino travel, to LGBTQ travel, uh, et cetera, those additional dollars have given us uh, some uh, uh, real needed emphasis in areas that we were not able to market to before. Um, in addition to that, we have announced recently a partnership between Brand USA, which Brand USA is the tourism cabinet for the U.S. Uh, they handle the, the promotion for U.S. tourism. Uh, it's, a, it's a partnership to f that focuses on Kentucky's bourbon industry, uh, and uh, it will help target international travels to this market because bourbon is a very popular reason for folks to come to Kentucky, uh, and it targets travelers from the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, Canada, India, and Australia. Uh, and then I don't want to forget the, the Tourism Development Act uh, through the uh, Finance Authority. Um, this year we have welcomed 13 new tourism development projects, nine of which have received final approval, totaling over $300 million for project investments in communities uh, across the state. And these are hotels. They are, uh, some of them have been uh, horse racing facilities, et cetera, and uh, it's an incentive program that uh, really means a lot to uh, these folks who are looking to create tourism opportunities in Kentucky. Our first, uh, uh, one of the agencies, or I guess if you count the Kentucky Department of Tourism, the Kentucky Heritage Council would be the second one I wanted to talk about, is the Kentucky Heritage Council. You see the numbers that are there in terms of general restricted and federal funding. Um, state funds that are distributed by this agency, as I mentioned, uh, the Kentucky African American Heritage Commission, $50,000 per the uh, General Assembly budget, and the American Battlefield Trust, uh, $3.3 million, and that's in uh, matching funds. Um, the um, Heritage Council received an annual appropriation uh, from the Federal Historic Preservation Fund, and that's administered through the, the SHPO, or the State Historic Preservation Officer, at a 40% match rate. Um, and uh, we do reporting on that annually to the National Park Service. Um, 
The Heritage Council uses both contracts and POs, by the way, in accordance with 45A. So that's how those dollars are uh, uh, distributed. The Historical Preservation Tax Credit Program utilizes preservation rehabilitation tax credits uh, intended to serve as financial incentives to encourage private investment in historic buildings. Uh, and that's the tax program that recently the General Assembly uh, assisted us in raising the overall program cap from $5 million to $100 million and the per project cap from $400,000 to $10 million. And that's a game changer in this industry and we really expect to see a lot of um, historic uh, preservation uh, and uh, folks taking advantage of those financial incentives. Um, finally, under uh, the Kentucky Heritage Council is the Main Street Program, and this is uh, uh, a unique program that is probably the gold standard in the nation uh, for communities. Currently, um, there are 26 Main Street programs in Kentucky. You see them listed here, uh, and um, they, uh, communities reported in 2021 $60.5 million in investment in downtown commercial districts that uh, by doing that, they reported they created 548 new jobs, 130 new businesses, and 201 historic building rehabilitation projects completed. Our next agency that I'd like to point out is the Kentucky Arts Council, and their mission is to foster environments for the people of Kentucky to value, participate in, and benefit from the arts. One of their partners, uh, you can see the, the, the breakdown in general restricted and federal funds. One of their federal partners is the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, and that agency funds, promotes, and strengthens the creative capacity of Kentucky's communities by providing Americans with diverse opportunities for uh, arts participation. And again, those payments are also done in accordance with 45A. Our next agency uh, that uh, I'd like to, to uh, talk a little bit about is the Kentucky Historical Society. Everybody says, oh, that's the History Museum. And you're right, that is the History Museum, but they also do a lot uh, uh, more than that as well. Uh, you'll see that they have general fund and restricted fund. They do not have any pass-through federal funds. Um, that second fund, that restricted fund, is from the taxpayer checkoff on the state tax return. So if folks go in there and say they want to give to their a portion of their return or uh, refund uh, to the local history trust fund, uh, they will get dollars uh, from that. Um, the Historical Society uh, is, is really busy also uh, with some things that are coming up, and thanks to the General Assembly who created some additional committees and commissions uh, in the past couple of sessions, they're responsible for planning the Kentucky Sester Centennial Commission. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying uh, 250 years uh, at Fort Herod. Um, and, uh, also, uh, the American 250 Sester Centennial Commission, which will celebrate the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Both of those will occur uh, upcoming. Uh, the uh, American 250 in 2026, the Harrodsburg Sester Centennial Commission in 2024, and the Kentucky State Park Centennial Commission also in 2024, when the state park system will be 100 years old. Um, you know, we kind of think about the state park system as being young when you're talking about America, but 100 years is nothing to, to sneeze at. Uh, our next agency that is involved in uh, the arts and heritage component is the Kentucky Humanities Council. Um, with the assistance of the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, and private contributions, they support public programs in the humanities throughout the Commonwealth. Um, they receive uh, grants, federal grants, from the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, and they have allotted about $20,000 of that uh, so far to rural museums uh, in Kentucky to assist uh, with the restoration of the uh, collections that were damaged due to the Eastern Kentucky flooding in July of 22. Uh, an, an agency like Apple Shop uh, would be a benefactor of uh, these pass-through dollars. Um, you may be aware the Humanities Council is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, uh, and it serves uh, 
all 120 counties. It delivers more than 15,000 programs and reaches more than 5 million people through its efforts. Most people know them uh, through either the Chautauqua performances that they have across the Commonwealth or from uh, the Kentucky Book Festival. The 41st annual one was just completed the first weekend uh, of, uh, or actually I guess it was the last weekend of October. Uh, and this year some of the speakers included Wendell Berry, Brian Kilmeade, Kentucky's Poet Laureate, Crystal Wilkinson, Silas House, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author John Meacham, and many more. Uh, and it was very well attended. It was held in Lexington this year. With that, I'm going to take a break and pass you to uh, the guy who gets to talk about uh, Kentucky's finest, the Kentucky State Parks Commissioner, Russ Meyer. Thank you, Secretary, and uh, thank you, Chair Miller. Uh, we appreciate you all having us here today again. Um, <clears throat> as Chair Miller uh, very well knows, uh, Kentucky State Parks, um, serving our Commonwealth um, in uh, um, this seat that I'm in, um, he will understand uh, a whole lot of what I'm, I'm getting ready to explain to you. Um, to the best of my knowledge and others, the Kentucky Department of Parks had not had a reorganization in over 20 years until recently. Overall, the reorg is completely budget neutral. The reorganization now makes up a solid commitment for East, Central, and Western parks with regional administrators for each region and managed by a director of park operations. Total parks include 45 parks, one rail trail, and one state scenic trail. By streamlining this effort, we now have a system that will benefit all parks and their employees and improve efficiency, management, and accountability. Moreover, the department has an engagement division that works with visitor services through recreation and interpretive naturalist-led programs and special events to engage visitors about the conservation and biological programs at various state parks. In addition, the state naturalist and the director work with all parks to provide quality programs that entice visitors to come back through memorable experiences. The department also maintains a database for all volunteer organizations. And the department now directs all trail towns in the Commonwealth. The Kentucky Trail Town Program is a tourism and economic development initiative designed to provide a strategic plan for communities to capitalize on local travel opportunities. The program recently welcomed Liberty, Burksville, and Hyden. Parks has been working diligently to complete undergoing projects for Wi-Fi accessibility. And if you know the location of our parks, it's not an easy uh, feat. To date, we have completed 15 of 17 lodges, which aren't as hard to get to as our campgrounds, but with our campgrounds, we've completed seven of 29. We currently have six campgrounds in progress right now at this point. Our Kentucky State Parks play an essential role in our state's emergency response efforts. During the pandemic, the array of services provided by our parks created an opportunity for us to provide necessary resources that position the Commonwealth at advantage for fighting the virus. Four Kentucky State Parks provided temporary housing for first responders, frontline healthcare workers, and low acuity patients utilizing over 2,000 room nights as a low acuity shelter. Some of our parks also served as vaccination sites. The December 11th Quad State Tornado was the worst tornado event in state history. With at least four tornadoes devastating eight Kentucky counties, the devastating event resulted in gov our governor declaring the state of emergency. The emergency declaration ensured that federal funding was available to provide emergency resources and rebuild our Western Kentucky communities. Our Ranger Division dedicated 33 Rangers and 6,868 Park Ranger hours to support efforts to rebuild our Western Kentucky communities. Our state parks served as a community resource by providing lodging 
for the American Red Cross utility crews, first responders, and displaced families. As a part of the state's emergency response effort, seven Kentucky state parks were designated to provide emergency, emergency shelter and food services for individuals impacted by the tornado. Our parks offered temporary housing to more than 800 individuals and 250 first responders. In total, nearly 2,600 individuals were housed by the programs offered through the state, Red Cross, and FEMA. In July, as a part of the state's emergency response efforts in eastern Kentucky, four Kentucky state parks have been designated to provide emergency shelters for individuals impacted by the flooding. Over 360 people impacted by the flooding have been temporarily housed at our parks in eastern Kentucky. Currently, 645 individuals are housed in 320 travel trailers, 65 of those travel trailers are on site at Jenny Wiley Car Creek uh, and Car Creek State Park. Since July, our park staff and volunteers have been working with the American Red Cross, local churches, businesses, and restaurants to ensure individuals impacted by the tornado have flooding, have basic needs, food, food shelter, and clothing. The Department of Parks utilizes general and restricted funds for operating only. We do not disperse any funds. However, we may be eligible to re receive federal funds through FEMA and other federal grants used exclusive, exclusively for parks towards the Commonwealth's emergency efforts. And I'll turn it back over to the Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. And um, if I can just add a postscript, um, when uh, the tornadoes in Western Kentucky occurred, um, there were obviously electricity was out and people were uh, literally um, having to crawl out of some damaged homes, et cetera. And um, at two o'clock in the morning, people started arriving by foot um, most of them at Penny Ryle State Park in Dawson Springs. Um, and it was just amazing to me that that park is such a part of that community that that's where people thought to go for shelter and for help. And what we found since then, not only through the flooding, but just, you know, throughout uh, the, the Commonwealth, is that our park system are so important to the communities that they're in. Uh, and uh, I want to give a big shout out uh, when, when we talk about our uh, uh, folks that work for the cabinet or in the, the tourism industry, our parks employees have done amazing things. They have gone from being housekeepers to counselors. Uh, to, uh, they've, they've helped to take care of pets uh, because last count, I think we had 40 some odd dogs and 25 cats also being housed at state parks because people didn't want to leave their pets when they lost their, their damaged homes. Uh, so we, we work with them as well. So I, I, just a huge shout out to our parks employees. Uh, they're out there in the trenches and they do incredible work. Um, the remainder of the, the presentation, we're going to give you a breakdown of our remaining agencies. I didn't make it through all 13 of them before I took a break. Um, they receive general funds and they're revenue generating agencies. Uh, now these revenues in the different agencies come from things like hunting and fishing, li fishing licenses, which you'll see in our uh, next agency, event sales, campgrounds, lodging, and gift shop sales. Uh, so they uh, do produce uh, a, a nice amount of revenue uh, to help offset some of the expense. We'll start with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Um, their conservation and recreation programs are second to none uh, in the country. They help to generate tremendous economic benefits to the Commonwealth from hunting and fishing and other wildlife-related uh, recreation. Uh, they produce $5.9 
$1.2 billion in total economic impact and support 70,000 jobs in Kentucky. And uh, we always teased them that they were the one thing during the pandemic that saw an increase in participation because people decided they wanted to go out and hunt and fish because it was safe to be outside. And they saw a huge spike in licenses uh, uh, and uh, 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 admissions uh, to, to their areas. To break that down, hunting is a $1.5 billion industry in to total economic impact, uh, creating 23,000 jobs. Fishing, $1.2 billion in economic impact, creating 12,000 jobs. Boating, $1.9 billion in total economic impact, uh, creating 15,000 jobs and wildlife watching $1.5 billion in e economic impact and creating over 19,000 jobs. Um, and you also see there uh, the members of the uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Officers. Um, they not only do a wonderful job at with wildlife and enforcing uh, regulations there, but they're the first people called on, along with our park rangers in these uh, uh, devastating tornadoes and floods that we've had to be able to respond to keep people safe. Next, we'll go to the Kentucky Artisan Center in Berea, Kentucky. Um, we got a, 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 a uh, uh, we, we send out surveys after people uh, visit there and we got a response from somebody that said, this is the nice re nicest rest area in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some truth to that because it did take the place of a rest area that was there, but it's really much more than that. Um, people will stop there, and I think they spend more time than they expect because they go in, uh, they see uh, the, the arts and crafts that are there for sale. Uh, we feature and support hundreds of Kentucky artisans and businesses uh, by purchasing their works and offering them for resale. Um, the Artisan Center sells uh, over $1.7 million in Kentucky-made crafts. Uh, it will have an average of 250,000 visitors each year uh, and about between two and 300 motor coaches, which that's a big area for people and people who are on motor coaches come out and they shop, which is good for uh, our economy, but they also eat. And the Artisan Center Cafe uh, offers regional favorites, grilled to order items. They will do uh, uh, box lunches if people don't have time to stay and eat and, and sell them to the groups to take back on the bus with them. And they feed hundreds of people per month. Next is the Kentucky Horse Park. Um, and uh, I, I like to refer to this and, uh, as the, it's the Disney World of the equestrian, uh, uh, the equestrian uh, circle because uh, it is just an incredible place. Uh, whether you're uh, a fan of horses uh, or you are just a tourist, uh, it, it leaves a huge impact uh, on not only the horse industry but tourism in general. It's a unique attraction that celebrates the human relationship of man and the horse through education, exhibition, uh, engagement, and competition. Um, you all know a lot of the different events that are there, the, the uh, Land Rover three-day event that are there. We just completed the National Horse Show. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, I always laugh and say, if you didn't get to see it in person, these things uh, are televised as well. Uh, and uh, this past year, in 2021, the Horse Park welcomed over 770,000 visitors uh, and also had 50,622 nights uh, in their, of camping uh, in the campgrounds. And the campground there has become so popular that we don't have to market or advertise it because it fills up on its own. Uh, and the programming, uh, if you've ever been out there for Halloween, it's crazy. Uh, you you want to go see it. Uh, the next one is uh, Kentucky Venues, or as a lot of us call it, the Kentucky State Fair Board. Uh, business and convention travel are major economic influences uh, for many of our urban communities, and two of these state-owned facilities uh, are in Louisville in the Kentucky Exposition Center and the Kentucky International Convention Center, and they've been recognized nationally and internationally uh, as best-in-class facilities. In fact, the International Convention Center was just selected as one of the Stella Awards, which is a travel industry uh, standard gold award winner 
winner for best convention center in the Midwest for the second year in a row. Um, both of these venues hosted 204 events in 2021. They're key economic drivers in, in the Louisville area. Uh, and I'm happy to report that uh, they have returned to about 93% of pre-pandemic levels already. And, you know, all the, the prognosticators said it would take probably five to 10 years for uh, convention travel to return to where it was. And we're seeing uh, through the team at, at Kentucky Venues uh, a return much quicker than that. The next area, Kentucky Performing Arts, or as I grew up calling it, the Kentucky Center for the Arts in Louisville. Um, the 2021-2022 season was their first season after the shutdown, and this was a facility that literally had to shutter uh, during the darkest days of the pandemic. Uh, this last year, they reported an attendance of nearly 250,000 visitors, holding 375 events and collecting over $25 million in revenue. Um, and I, I like to also point this out, in July and August of this year, uh, they had a first at the Center for the Arts, uh, the touring production of Jagged Little Pill, which was a Tony Award winning show on Broadway, needed a place to go to stage itself for the tour because tours are smaller than the Broadway productions and to work out the, the technical aspects. And they chose the Kentucky Center for the Arts. So they spent uh, the biggest part of two months there uh, doing that. And then they debuted the touring production in Louisville, two nights that were sold out, widely acclaimed, and then they went to Dallas for uh, prime time. Um, one of the things we're finding is not only there in, at, at the Center for the Arts uh, in Kentucky Performing Arts, uh, but also um, that's happening with the show Beetlejuice at the Carson Center in Paducah. Uh, the 1st of December. It's staged for a national tour there. They go through tech. They perform uh, one night in Paducah, and then they will hit the road. Uh, and so we are finding a market for these facilities uh, that keep us uh, uh, in, in the mind of Broadway producers. Um, the Kentucky uh, the Governor's School for the Arts is uh, a program of Kentucky Performing Arts, um, and it began in 1987, and it brings young uh, people uh, to, from across Kentucky together to work with professional uh, instructors and guest artists. Uh, these two, uh, this year they did two three-week sessions. Uh, they were both held at uh, the University of Kentucky. Uh, they're free, they're highly competitive, uh, and many scholarship opportunities await as a result of that. Um, and thanks to some ARPA ESSER funds, that's an education program, uh, just in time for the 35th anniversary of the, the uh, School for the Arts in 2022, uh, we were able to double the class size. So we did 250 in the first session, uh, which was the normal amount, but now we were able to do another 250 for a total of 50. Uh, I'm sorry, for a total of 500 uh, students in that program this summer. The next slide I just wanted to share with you, and I know it's small print if you're looking at the screen. This is our capital projects budget. Uh, many of our agencies uh, have capital project pools and line item renovation projects. Uh, and we appreciate that uh, through the budget process. Uh, those projects that are listed uh, do much needed re renovation and deferred maintenance, which is a word that the commissioner is very familiar with. Uh, projects not only in parks, but in all of our agencies. Most of these agencies are revenue generating and this invests in the future of bringing tourists to Kentucky. So kind of going back to this idea of how diverse we are, um, I just wanted to share this slide with you, which always gets a chuckle out of groups and for me seems almost sometimes a little overwhelming. Our cabinet operations include 45 state parks that have 17 resort lodges, 14 historic sites, 13 golf courses that we operate, 34 pools and beaches, 15 marinas, 32 campgrounds, 12 equestrian competition rings. We manage, or if you can operate a horse, 80 horses, including a former Kentucky Derby winner at the Kentucky Horse Park. Uh, we operate over 1.5 million square feet of event and convention space. And finally, 58 wildlife management areas, which total over 161,000 acres of land. And all of that is managed under the auspices of these 13 agencies that do a tremendous job under the cabinet. 
So with that, that concludes our presentation. I would like to introduce to you a couple other folks who are behind me, the uh, chief of staff uh, and uh, the person who tries to keep me in line, uh, sometimes successfully, uh, Yvonne Board. Yvonne is the chief of staff in the secretary's office. Um, our director of finance, Melissa Brewer and BR Masters, who is our legislative liaison. Uh, and also with us today is Ron Vanover, and Ron is the Deputy Commissioner of Parks. And I don't think that there is a park, a trail, or a historic site. I won't say that you've worked at, but I know you've uh, been there and visited and know the ins and outs. So uh, we have a very seasoned team that I'm very proud of. Yeah, Mr. I'm, Chairman, I'm that concludes very my Very familiar with Ron. He, he was uh, a great help to me when I was commissioner. Uh, um, I tell him he knows where the bodies 16. are buried, and I don't think he likes that. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we probably do have a number of cemeteries on our properties. Uh, now that I think about it, thinking down to Lake Cumberland, I think we have a cemetery down there. Um, or, but nonetheless, thank you all for your presentation. Uh, it's, uh, I think it was 20, close to 30 pages. So I'll just throw it open for the group. Any questions, Daniel will uh, be on the lookout. And otherwise, I'll just go. I have a number of questions myself. So Representative McCool, you get the first shot. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was just sitting there thinking how we were blessed in, to live in Kentucky with, with all that's available, to stay, to visit, and, and the opportunities there. There isn't anything that you, I mean, there's no reason that you can't say I have nothing to do where I live. <laughs> because you probably don't have to go very far to see something different. So I, I just want to thank you for bringing all of that out. And, and, and we really are. We're, we're blessed, and, and people that come to visit us are blessed too. So, uh, uh, you know, we've even got an uptick lately, unfortunately, with Laura Lynn's passing, but there's a lot of tourism coming down that way too. So, but thank you for everything you're doing. I was just curious, you know, one of the uh, statements that the uh, chair made earlier, what it's an opportunity for you to share what, what you've got, but also opportunity to uh, share things that you may need. And I was just curious, do you have a strategic plan, like a five-year plan on, on a, I'm, I'm thinking of where we need to go from here? Oh, one thing, you have to have somebody maintaining all this. That's critical. That's, uh, but also... Hey, what we got to do to to uh, help achieve those goals, and who's responsible for that? Do you have strategic planning in, in place to do it to do that as well? But thank you for the presentation, and thank you for what you've done for Kentucky. Thank you. I'm going to toss it to Russ on that, but I will tell you that there are um, strategic plans for all of our agencies, uh, and they fall under the auspices of those executive directors, uh, and uh, they are uh, constantly being updated. Uh, and again, as, uh, as I pointed out in several of these, the yeah. legislature uh, has been very generous to the tourism cabinet in, in the last couple of sessions uh, in order to, to help us be able to um, maintain our facilities and also to create new opportunities. Russ, do you want to talk about parks? I'd love to. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Representative. Thank you, Secretary. And thank you, uh, Representative McCool. But within the next two weeks, we're going to uh, be making a presentation to um, the A&R Committee um, based on um, appropriations that uh, um, General Assembly has uh, um, directed to Kentucky State Parks. Um, which is is a great opportunity not only for uh, the General Assembly, for Kentucky State Parks tourism, um, for our Commonwealth. Because um, as we, you, you know, Representative Miller will know being in local government um, through, over the years and in this position, um, we hit the recession in 2008 and that was about the time we really needed to reinvest some serious money in parks but at that point in time uh, we weren't in a position to do that the commonwealth was not um, we understand that and we had to uh, uh, go a different route and uh, now we have an opportunity to reinvest in in our parks and and i hope that we we have that opportunity um, the amount of money that uh, um, you all designated four parks was 150 million. Um, we are going to focus on, uh, um, as the secretary mentioned, um, our revenue uh, 
um, parts, revenue generators in parks mm -hmm. and, and how we can uh, benefit uh, those areas. But uh, deferred maintenance is, uh, is out there. It's uh, 30, 40 years uh, past us and, uh, you know, it's going to be quite costly. But uh, um, you've stepped up to the plate, made tough decisions to um, allocate uh, an amount of money that uh, is going to help us to, uh, in, in and it's in need, and uh, we thank you all for that. But um, we'll be making that presentation within the next two weeks. Um, we're finalizing that um, this week. So uh, looking forward to that. And uh, I think Representative McCool, you are on that committee, I believe. Um, so stay tuned, I guess, is how I would answer that, that question. Thank you, and right. thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on slide four about when you're listing the cabinet agencies that uh, I was looking for things that have been new in the last 15, 16 years uh, since I was integrally involved in that. And the Kentucky Center for African American Heritage, uh, is that from an administrative standpoint? Are there general funds involved in that? Um, the Center for African American Heritage is administratively tied to the cabinet. There is a line item in the budget uh, that we are allotted in general funds that goes to uh, them for uh, maintenance, upkeep, and... and uh, but that's different from the Kentucky African American Heritage Commission, which is shown on slide 10, that, the $50,000, right? That is correct. Okay. Am I correct on that? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Want right. to make sure. Yes. I assume that would be the case. Uh, so they, get, they do get general fund. Now, the Center for Performing Arts, or the Performing Arts... Uh, as we say, uh, they get, I know they got capital money. Do they get general fund money as well? No, sir, they don't. Okay, so they are a little bit different then. That they are, okay. uh, and again, somewhat, again, administratively tied, uh, especially since the, the state owns the building. Right. Uh, but uh, that's the, the dollars that they get from the state are in maintenance pool money. So, uh, again, this year you all were very generous to them because the front stairs to the Center for the Arts after it was opened in 1983 uh, are crumbling, and they were going to have to block it off and tell people they had to come in the back door. And you all were very kind and uh, gave the dollars, and the repairs on that have begun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Deputy Secretary, or uh, <laughs> Co-Chairman, don't, don't give me a don't give me a job. Uh, well, thank y'all for being here. Uh, one of the neat things I did uh, this summer is we took a staycation and we went to uh, fourteen state parks that we'd wow. never been to in a week's time. It was busy. It was busy, and uh, we and and we took a day in Louisville just doing like tourist stuff. And uh, it was really an enjoy enjoyable time. Saw things we'd never seen before. Uh, we learned to uh, check the weather before we went to the gorge mm. to make sure you could actually see something. You know, we we showed up at that. I forget what the name of the point was, but I mean, literally all we could see was fog. Oh. And we were like, "All right, been there, done that." Yep. <laughs> but uh, it was a. I'm sure it was a good site, and we'll make our way back that way. But probably the biggest thing that I saw, and I wanted you to speak to this, uh, Commissioner Meyer, is that, you know, the biggest thing every park I went to, it stuck out like a sore thumb, was just pool problems. I mean, even some of them had, you know, yellow tape like there was. It was almost embarrassingly too obvious. And I know you were doing it for fa for safety to keep people out of that, but... Is the, is the objective to get all of those pools back up and running, or is, is, is the pool business going away, and we, are we trying to move away from pool business? Does that make sense? I know it, going to the pool at the state park isn't like it used to be you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago, and does it make sense for us to put millions of dollars in those facilities? Well, I guess you're going to force me to let the cat out of the bag, aren't you? <laughs> I noticed there's, you know, $10 million each year in the budget. Right. So. No, but that, that is in our uh, proposal, too. Good. I believe we have 10 pool. We had 10 pools down this summer. Yeah. 10. And take a uh, General Butler. Yep. 
where that is the feature there. activity. That's right. Right in the middle of the lodge, uh -huh. and it's shut down. And it's that deferred maintenance where we haven't been able, we haven't been reinvesting yep. and haven't had the budget to take care of them. You're giving us that opportunity to take care of, and we're gonna we're gonna take care of those this upcoming year. Yes, oh, they great. will be taken care of. Now we have to look at at what yeah. options are best. Are are pools the best option for a certain park, or is a splash pad a mm -hmm. better option for right. the longevity? Um, you know, pools have a a lifespan that's much shorter than a splash pad, and would a splash pad do serve well, the same purpose? A pool requires a lifeguard. Right. Yeah. There you go. There you go. So those are some of the things we're going to dive into within the next two weeks. And uh, um, good, good. so, yes, that's in our plan. Very good. And just one little follow-up with that. So, um, and it, this is kind of defer, a question on deferred maintenance in general. So I know that y'all go to conventions and uh, you get together with your – like leaders in other states mm -hmm. so would you consider are most states really far behind on deferred maintenance where would you find us on a hundred to zero where would you find kentucky compared to other states are we really far to the zero side or are we in the same basket as a lot of southern other southern states right well i've been in this position two years and, uh, you know, have found out where a lot of our state parks are. I have been to every yeah. state park that we have. And, uh, you know, I'd like to know what 14 that you went to yeah. and how your experience I was. We can do that outside of here. But, uh, um, you know, somebody like um, Ron Vanover, our deputy commissioner, right. who's been in parks for almost 30 years, may be able to answer that question a little bit better. Sure. Um, Ron, do you want to try to? Try to answer Senator's yeah, question. Make way for uh, way. Deputy Commissioner to get a mic, get to a microphone, please. Yeah, he can please. sit right here. I see. <laughs> no we'll make sure we hear him. Surgery, so let me see if we get set in this chair. Just pick it up. You can just pick it up and keep standing if you'd like. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and congratulations on your upcoming retirement. Very much thank appreciate you. you over the years. Our swimming pools, as you know, Representative Miller, evolve every four to five years, whether it be with the Earth's rotation, whether it be with maintenance. I would put us in the middle of the road with the rest of the states. Um, it seems like even during your tier near Mr. Miller, we were always having to look at them. And there's yeah, a they, lot to They be had just put in the new federal regulations on pool drains. That was like 16, 18 years ago. That was the big issue because you had to replace you had to do some major work on all those pools 18 Graham, years ago, and it's probably Graham, been that long since there was a major investment. Virginia Graham-Baker Act, I think, is what created that. But we are working diligently. But when you have these big swimming pools and you've got the Earth's rotation, you've got water constantly, you've got thousands of visitors each year, it's a little bit different from your own swimming pool. So I do believe in Commissioner Meyer, Secretary Berry, and others, that we have to look into the future of what we're going to do. And I think splash pads are evident. Look what happened at E.P. Tom Sawyer when we put a splash pad in on one certain segment of that. So that's where I would put us. Very Thank you all. Thank you. If I could also add that, you know, several of these pools, um, while they are on state park property, they're also – important to the communities that they serve. If yeah. you go to Cumberland Falls State Park, uh, I mean, that is a community pool as mm -hmm. much as it is a state park. Yep. And in fact, Burnside Burnside as well, I think. Uh, right, at Blue Licks. I mean, you know, it's the only swimming pool, the only public pool in Robertson County is at Blue Licks State Park. So, um, you know. And with that said, you know, just an example of, of Blue Licks, um, five years ago, I believe they Commonwealth put seven hundred and seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in that pool and it's shut down right now. Wow. So that's a it that for example is a complete redo or it could serve better as a splash pad, a decision we need to yeah. make for the betterment of that park, that community, um, you know, and the future of it. So uh, it's just 
so important, so necessary, um, not only to Kentucky State Parks, but to these communities yep. um, that have state parks in them, that we get this funding, that we get the full funding so we can get moving as quick as possible to uh, um, get these projects done. I agree. Well, thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Secretary, on page uh, on slide seven, you uh, the new one popped up that I had not noticed before. Friends of Holt House. That's yes. is that a historic home in near E Town? It is. Yeah. Okay. And and this is was I'm that a look, one time? Or I'm going to look at Melissa. No, sir, it's not. Is this the? One time. It, it is one time. Well, but this isn't the first time it's appeared in the budget. Oh, okay. All right. She corrected me. It, it is the first time that it's appeared in our budget, but they have received state funds before. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, the, on the ARPA slides. Yes, sir. Uh, that was a big number, 92 million. Mm -hmm. uh, but parks didn't get any ARPA money? No, sir. Okay. Why? I'm just, I was really surprised about that. How come if we just didn't qualify our state parks? I, I thought that it funneled through the General Assembly and you all, yeah, and I don't, as, as a body, not being on A&R, I can't answer sent that, that so. uh, I, to our agency. I'm not sure. ARPA, ARPA does have, and, and I'll just make a general overview comment, uh, does have some pretty distinct regulations where, where the dollars can go. For instance, um, you know, we had some people who, that came to us and said, well, this would be great for, um, you know, festivals. Well, festivals by the regulation are not uh, eligible to receive uh, ARPA money. So it, it, you know, in Kentucky, we have the 75 million is going to, in order to get it out into communities, destination marketing organizations, the tourism commissions, uh, and, and we had to get a legal opinion on that one, little t, little c, uh, because in some of the, the communities, the fiscal courts act as the uh, tourism commissions for their county, uh, and they are eligible. Okay. And can I can I interject one thing on that, sure. Secretary? Please, Chairman. Um, one project that we were involved in um, as as parks and Representative McCool knows this project all too well is in in Paintsville at Paintsville Lake. Um, we partnered with Johnson County uh, Fiscal Court. They had ARPA money to go towards mm -hmm. a uh, ADA fishing pier, which is a unbelievable project seven hundred thousand dollar project so there are partnership opportunities in in our communities where we will come in and facilitate and help and uh, um, you know in in within our park system so that's a that's a special uh, project I know to Representative McCool and and that entire community there it's going to be uh, a, a huge addition to that park so uh, thank you uh, on slide 21, there was a uh, uh, fish and wildlife resources. I, uh, again, not being on A&R, I thought fish and wildlife was operated entirely on restricted and federal funds. They do have general fund now. Is that, do you, can you tell us what that specifically goes for? Sure, and I'm going to look, if you don't mind, I'm going to look no, at I, our I finance person again. That's why she's here. If you could come to a mic, please. Here you go. Melissa, she can have my seat. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations on your retirement. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, for Fish and Wildlife, this is the first time that they will receive general funds. I'm sure we've all heard um, that they don't usually have a general fund appropriation. It is a one time allocation to support the Kentucky Cumberland Forest Conservation Program. Um, and that's the most information that I have on it, but I'm happy to get more information if you need it. Okay. Okay. All right. As far as you know, it's one time. It is. Um, in, in the budget language, it is a one-time allocation, as far as I've heard. <laughs> All right. Very good. Um, thank you, Melissa. 
Members, are there any other questions? I, the only last question I had was, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner, and that was camping. Uh, are we still on the reservation system? So the electronic reservation system, was that still functional? We are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We are. So Reserve America? That's it. Yes. Sir. Yes. Is that when you got started? I, I can't recall if it was uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Ward or I, but it was all right. about that same time. Uh, if I will, um, Chair Miller, I do want to um, throw a nice compliment out to you. Um, we had a meeting uh, planning for this uh, um, $150 million, putting our plan together, and one of our directors uh, um, was talking uh, and said, you know, uh, Commissioner Miller um, sent me a nice handwritten note one time thanking me just for everything I did, and he said, I still have that in my desk today. So oh, that's nice to much, hear. much appreciated years later. Um, well, that's, so, that's very nice yeah. to hear. I, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, Co-Chair Mills. Just a couple of things. You mentioned uh, I'm always interested in uh, the Kentucky venues. Uh, when we go to the State Fair, uh, Commissioner Beck uh, always gives a great overview, and I'm always amazed at how busy that place is and how – quickly they turn things over and how many staff members they have you know of course we're there right during the state fair but uh was just curious uh <clears throat> you said you're back 93 percent uh do we have any concerns about crime and uh safety in downtown louisville now or how is that being overcome and what's being done by the convention center there to alleviate that and get bookings up can you talk a little bit about that um, I do know, uh, and I sit as the governor's representative on the state fair board, so that 93% number was literally from Thursday's yeah. or Friday's <laughs> board meeting. Um, and I do know that Sean Hensler, who is their director of security there, was a retired LMPD, um, was, um, ha has reported that they have uh, been working on a plan uh, in conjunction with LMPD and, uh, in fact, they uh, work in conjunction with state police as well um, to um, increase security. Uh, and, and I think that you've seen um, as groups have come back uh, and the occupancy of the hotels, et cetera, as more people are downtown, yeah. um, their, their uh, uh, efforts have kind of been rewarded. Uh, but yes, they, they have put a safety and security plan together at, at that level. Uh, you can imagine that they, uh, it, it's constantly being tweaked. We know that there were some uh, purported challenges during the state fair uh, as well. Um, and, uh, you know, the good news was that our state fair attendance was back up to big numbers, uh, pre-pandemic numbers. Uh, that's great. The bad news is when you get a group of people together, sometimes somebody's going to act out. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm very impressed when I hear them uh, report on the plans from a security and safety standpoint. Um, and, and I believe that uh, uh, that, that is... Uh, uh, that that's being rewarded by these increased bookings uh, that are in the uh, uh, especially in kick downtown right. in Louisville and just to follow up on that so when when this occurred when the pandemic started mm -hmm. and we had the challenges downtown in Louisville I mean basically you know we had a lot of cancellations what was done with those losses I mean how how did y'all book those accounting wise do you even have a number to be able to 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 re to even put down on paper what your losses were there is that something that the fair board has gone through extensively and has a number on and was that uh were those opportunity losses or were they real dollar losses well um i, I would tell you that anytime you shut something down there's going to be real dollar losses yeah. involved what they were able to do and this says a lot about the staff uh at uh the, at Kentucky venues and especially their sales staff is when they found a group who called them and said, look, because of the pandemic, we're going to cancel our conference. And instead of just saying, I'm sorry that you had to do that, they said, okay, we can move you to this date. 
Uh, and, and they were able to do that in many of those instances. So it's what I guess I would call deferred revenue. Yeah. Um, the, the, the group is still coming, uh, a lot of them. Uh, and uh, in fact, we're seeing them begin to return now that we're roughly two years out. Yeah. Um, so, I, but but I'm sure that there were dollar losses that could be attributed to that. I mean, uh, I, I know that we we ended up with cost overrides, uh, but you know, from from finance because yeah. the revenue wasn't there for the expense for the fair board. I, I would be happy to get. I know they have that number. I just don't want to quote a wrong number. I'd be happy to get it to you. I'd and, be, I'm just curious about okay. that. So that'd be great. You could follow up on that. And then finally. Uh, can you comment on the NCSL convention that's going to happen? Like, is that next year? I understand it is, yes. And I heard that was like going to be the biggest, one of the biggest conventions in Louisville that that year or maybe ever. Is that, do you know I have, much about that? I, I, I have heard, it, it's been discussed in, in the uh, meetings, uh, the National Council of State Legislators, yeah. lectures, um, and it is going to be a keystone convention yeah. for the city. Um, you know, next year, really the next two years promise when you think about the PGA, when you think about that convention, uh, there, there are a lot of big things that are going to be happening in Louisville. Um, and, uh, in addition to that, we've got the national convention of the, uh, and it occurs only every two or three years. Uh, I should know that I'm Episcopalian, but the uh, Episcopal Church USA uh, has selected Louisville as their city as well, and I believe it's next year. So um, a shout out to them. But yes, I, I know that there are a lot of preparations that are going on. They're utilizing many different uh, uh, many different uh, venues uh, around the city to host people and, and hospitality venues. It's obviously in multiple hotels uh, across the community as well. Yeah. Um, I, I remember when they brought in the, was it the Southern Legislative Conference yeah. uh, yes. that was there and they put up the world's biggest tent, I think, on the, the grounds in Waterfront Park. Uh, I was working at the Derby Festival at the time and I was drooling for a tent that day. <laughs> uh, but uh, that that is just going to be a small amount of what uh, NCSL will yeah. be bringing. And I know we've talked a lot about Louisville and I'll just make this final comment. I just, oh, during the summer, uh, when I did visit Louisville when we were downtown walking, felt very safe, and for the most part it was clean. Uh, I will say that I was really impressed with kind of the New Lou area what, and mm-hmm. and went to a soccer match recently and went to that new stadium, which was awesome. I mean, it just was a very cool venue for soccer and things of that nature. So I think there are some good things. And, you know, if I were to rewind back two years ago, I was really concerned about tourism in the future of downtown Louisville, and I'd say it's bounced back pretty good. Well, I think you've hit the, I, I would agree with you, and I think you've hit the nail on the head when you talk about New Lou. It's obviously a, a, a huge draw for people, people who are a lot younger than I am. Mm-hmm. Um, Me too. And uh, uh, the Louisville City and the Lynn Family Stadium that's been built. And in fact, I mean, uh, you know, Lou City played in the national championship last night yeah. uh, in San Antonio. So uh, unfortunately, they didn't win. Uh, but, uh, you know, you have a game there. They had the one. Women's Cup for the second year in a row this summer uh, at that stadium, and there were uh, eight teams, four from the U.S. and four from uh, uh, Europe and, and, and Asia. So it's it's an incredible venue. And also a big shout-out, and I, this could go on forever, yeah. but a big shout-out to Lexington, who hosted the Breeders' Cup uh, mm-hmm. this uh, two weekends ago. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, an incredible day, and the economic impact that was brought uh, to the, the bluegrass area um, is uh, considerable. I was with the Visit Lex people, and they're still walking on cloud nine. Good, good, good. Thank you so much. Good. Uh, <coughs> members, I, I see no more uh, hands raised. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Commissioner, we have had a practice of if our members have questions later, uh, sending them to you, sending to you all, and then you respond in writing to us. Yes, sir. And uh, generally, we've not been having people come back to us. We did, I think, the first time, but yeah. uh, physically. Um, the only follow-up I would have, and this is kind of an uh, old question that uh, uh, has been bouncing around, and that is you have a lot of land with that 
fish and wildlife operates. Mm-hmm. You've got a lot of land that parks operates, uh, some of which I think is on nature preserve, state nature preserves. Is there an administrative rationale that you could uh, dis- determine why that is kept separate as opposed to, it seems like, you know, management of a lot of land um, would fit well with nature preserves and the uh, and, uh, uh, state parks and the uh, fish and wildlife lands. So that just from a, and again, we're looking for ideas that where, are there reorgs that you need uh, that would be outside your cabinet that would affect outside your cabinet. So I know that's something you'd have to kick upstairs. So. Sure. Um, and I will I will check on that. I know some of it, uh, and as you're well aware uh, from your experience there, some of it is that uh, uh, there are national wildlife preserves. Uh, and uh, uh, also, you know that many of our state parks are leased uh, from uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. Mm-hmm. And, um, y- you know, I- I've learned all kinds of things that we've even got one at Burnside that the Army Corps owns up to 750 feet and then everything beyond 750 feet <laughs> up is state property so I, I i haven't quite figured out how you'd ever yeah. claim a, a deed on that one but um uh yeah I, th- I think a lot of it uh is because of the nature of some of these but uh let me get some more information sure. and get that'd back be with great you. well thank you all for your uh, attendance and your presentations i know you put a lot of time in it and thank your staff as well um, and uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we will uh, stand adjourned. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all.